Thanks for, thanks for coming along. There's, there's a lot of, lot of interesting talks on all, all the time, especially in this slot. So thank you for, thank you for picking this one over the other ones. Um, yeah, so I hope, hope everyone's having a good time so far. I know uh, I know I am. So just a little, little introduction. Hi, my name's Noel. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I work for 47 Degrees. Um, so we're a, we're a global consultancy. We're based in, in Spain, in the US, and in London as well. And um, you know, we've got, we've got a, a sponsorship here, so we've got a booth. So generally, generally I'd come and say hello and like find people in t-shirts like this, but I think half the conference now has t-shirts like this. So uh, can you tell me how to get them? Okay, so to get them, uh, you can come along to our booth. So we've got a big red booth with a 47 logo on in the, in the hallway. Um, or alternatively, we do sell them through the website as well. Um, kind of a, a non-profit approach there. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've got them, but you've got to be quick because they're pretty popular, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so we're going to talk about algebraic data types today. Um, does anybody not know what they are? Right, this talk is for people who don't know what they are. Okay, so <laughs> um, it's... it's if you do know, you might find this quite basic. Um, you could probably point out lots of mistakes I'm making or heckle, but pl please don't. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through this together, hopefully. Um, for those who don't know what they are, um, great. That's what this is about. OK, so have got a pretty, pretty brief agenda as to what we'll be doing. Um, I'm going to give a very, very short introduction into, into what an algebraic data type is and, and, and why it's got that name. We'll take a look at two or three ADTs that are out in the wild. You might not even realize that they are ADTs, and then, and then what we use them for. And then we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna create our own collection type. Um, it is an ADT, we'll be making use of that. We'll be you know, using the correct data structure and things like that. So um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll be a little, bit, a little bit of interest along the way. Okay, so. What does, what does Wikipedia say? Um, so Wikipedia says this. In computer programming, especially in functional programming and type theory, an algebraic data type is a kind of composite type. That is, a type formed by combining other types. That's, that's, that's actually a pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty, pretty thorough explanation. And um, that's just what we're going to see over the next half hour or so, is, is, is this kind of thing in action and, and what we can do with it. Not to be confused with abstract data types. It's nothing to do with functional programming. That gets called ADTs as well. OK, so let's start at the very beginning. We're going to count some values. OK, so how many different values can a Boolean have? This is not a trick question. Right? Two, right? Two. Yeah. What about an integer? I don't need the exact number. But, you know, maybe power of two. You know? So it's two, two to the power of 32, isn't it? How many different values can this one have? One, yeah, it's got one value, that's right. How about these? Strings, lists? Inf they're infinite, yeah. You can just have as many as you want, basically. So what about, what about these ones? How many values can this have? A tuple of booleans and ints. How many distinct values can that have? Two to the 33, that's right. So. For all the integers, you can either have a true or false. You've effectively expanded the integer family by a, an extra bit there. Okay? Does everyone does everyone follow that? Why that? that you know, so, for all the trues, you've got all the numbers that an integer could be, and for all the falses, you've got the same. Okay. What about this type? Either a boolean or an int. What do we think? How many how many different values can this type have? Two to thirty-two plus two, yeah. And I mean, this is you know, this is not this is not hard. You know, this this type either holds an integer or it holds a boolean. So we're effectively just adding the adding the totals together. And so with the with the tuple, we were effectively multiplying. With the either, we were effectively adding. So you know, tuples are products. You know, you, the multiplication the products. You multiply the values together. Either's are often called coproducts. So just as a, a little bit of an, an aside, um, John Pretty gave a very, very interesting talk at Flatmap a few years ago, 
um, based on the work from uh, the academic Connor McBride, where he basically took this concept to the extreme. So effectively treating Booleans as the number two, unit as one, ethers as plus, tuples as multiply. And he did some really, really fun stuff, like effectively um, differentiating with algebra and then getting brand new types out, and those types were related to the original types. It's, it's, it's only about a 15-minute talk, but it's, it's well worth a look. And um, just, just another aside here, how many different values could this type hold? A function from Boolean to int. Any ideas? So if we think of functions, like we, you know, instances of functions, so we, we could have a function where the true goes to, say, zero, and false goes to one, and then we could have another instance of the function where true goes to minus 12 and false goes to 36. And actually what, what happens here is it's the return type to the power of the parameter type. So it's 2 to the 32 squared in this case. Just, that's just a, just a bit of interest, really. OK, so we'll go back, back, to, this, back to this tuple, um, booleans and ints. Um, all makes sense. What about this type? Is there any difference? What, what can we see here? So we've got a case class, which takes parameter of a boolean and an integer. Same? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you can, you know, there's an argument maybe that the case class has slightly more information to a, to a developer. You know, we, we know what it's for. We know what the Boolean means. Um, but really, you know, we can flip between one type and the other without losing any value. That's, um, that's called isomorphism. So, you know, they're, they're not so different. And how about this? So, so we, we, we moved there with the tuple to a, a more kind of, uh, I don't know what the right word would be, um, intuitive type. For, for a particular domain. And I wonder if we could do a similar thing with, with an either. So this one's a little bit more complicated, is that the right word? And then we might, we might end up with something like this. So we'll have a sealed trait, and I've called this database response. You know, this is a very, a very crude example, I suppose. And then we can have the, the case class we saw on the previous slides, that's some kind of invoice. And that's the Boolean of the int. And then we have the error message type, which takes a string. And really, when we, when we create an instance of a, a database response, we're going to instantiate this to one or the other. Right? And this is, this is all this is. You know, is this really any different? And I don't think it is in any way. OK? So what we've seen here is when we group types together, we call them products. And when we, and when we, um, when we have some kind of either, they're often called co-products and often some types. So when people talk about products and some types, this is what they're talking about. Um, for those early in their Scala journey, um, and maybe not too familiar with something like um, Shapeless, um, this, this is kind of the, the meat of what Shapeless does. Is it, it, it takes things like case classes and it, it kind of breaks them down into their raw parts, and then you're able to build those back up in other ways if necessary. And so they're in, in Shapeless, they're called um, H-lists and co-products. Okay. So we'll just have a look at a few common types that, 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 are, that are algebraic data types. Okay, so straight off the bat, we'll look at option. And this code I've, I've copied and, and kind of edited to, to only show the interesting parts but this is copied straight out of the, the Scala 2.12 code. So we have some kind of sealed abstract class. Now, before, I was using a sealed trait, and now we've got a sealed abstract class. And for the purposes of this, there's no difference. The, the, the key part here is that this is sealed. So if you're not familiar with that, is that what you're telling the compiler is when you create a sealed thing, which would either be an abstract class or a trait, every subclass of that type will be given in the same file. And this, this means, this tells the compiler that, that there is never going to be a different type that we don't know about ever created. And, um, and so th this, is, this is really good for you as programmers, is that you know that, say, when you see a, 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 something of type option, you know it's either going to be a sum or a none. Like, nobody can come along and ever create another type. 
No one can say, oh, I've got this really special use case and I want to stick one in there, you know, which often you can do with, say, some of the Java types. Um, so I suppose in a way this is a little bit similar to you know, those from Java land, something like an enumeration. So enumeration is like a, an abstract final class, but then all the, all the instances it could be are, are, are given there in the, in the class. And so for this option, we've, we've got two types. We can either have a sum value or we can have a none. Hopefully, hopefully there's nothing, nothing too surprising here. And so this is what this means to be an algebraic data type, is that we've got, we've got a co-product here is that we can either have a sum or we can have a none. We can't have both. You know, we could, we could write this type in other ways and not lose any information. So we could have written this as, say, either, and then one type would be the A, and then the other type would be unit. Uh, it's not as nice, and you know, we don't have all the value of you know, S-O-M-E and N-O-N-E, but you know, at a purely conceptual level, they would be exactly the same things. Okay. And similarly, a list is an algebraic data type as well. And so we have the, the type list. And then if you look in the source code, there's only two types that, that, that extend from list. And we've got this funny one with the dots, which is called cons, which is short for constructor. Um, and that's how we really create them. And then we've got our, our kind of recursive base case as well. OK, so these, um, these are probably not the most interesting examples, at least. So maybe we'll try something a bit better. Okay. So maybe we could look at some JSON, right? So we can encode all the different types that JSON can be in, into an algebraic data type, okay? So we've got all the different things. So uh, JSON can be a number, can be a Boolean, can be a string, can be array, can be even more JSON, uh, and of course it can be a null as well. And this actually, this, this model actually lends itself really well to being an algebraic data type. Okay, and you know I wrote this myself. This has not been copied from anywhere. Um, but you imagine if you were to do this yourself, it would probably look something a bit like this. So we're going to have some kind of sealed trait called JSON, and then all the different states that JSON can have are going to be some kind of class that extends from JSON. This is sealed as well. So any anyone using our, our fancy new JSON library, like there aren't enough already, then you know that these are the only types you're ever going to have to deal with. And then the nice thing here, and you know, hopefully, hopefully you're aware of this, is that when it comes to, say, doing things like pattern matching, um, the compiler's smart enough to know that if you haven't got everything covered, it can give you a warning. It knows that if you have, it doesn't need to do this warning, and there's no need for a kind of trap all base case unless that's what you want. Um, so yeah, it can, be, it can be quite handy in that. And um, have a look at Circe, if people are aware of that. It's, um, I think it's in the type level uh, family of projects. Um, this, this example was kind of inspired by it. It's not exactly the same. Um, Circe actually um, makes these constructors private for, for reasons I don't fully understand. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, that's, that's quite a nice way of looking at, at these algebraic data types. Um, and there are plenty of other libraries that do them as well. There's things for S expressions and, and the like. Right, so what's, um, what's the point of all this, right? You know, it's not really, not really much use to what we've been doing so far, you know. Considering you all know what algebraic data types are, you know, you're probably wondering why I'm wasting your time. But, um, I mean, types are good, right? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of using types. You know, I, I'd rather use something like a JSON Boolean rather than a Boolean because that helps me kind of define my domain and helps me understand that if I'm using these types not in a JSON way, then you know, there's a leak there and something's gone wrong. Uh, I tend to lean on the compiler as much as I can. So using, using appropriate types for the appropriate things I find to be, to be really useful. Okay. And it's like I said, you know, that the more you do this, the more intuitive they get, and they become more natural than, say, using strings where a, you know, a case class would, would, would be more appropriate. I said in the previous slide as well is that we, you know, we can be really explicit about marking all the states that, that we can ever possibly have. And we're, we're, you know, we're opening a conversation with the compiler here. And the compiler is going to help us because we've told the compiler that there's no other types can exist outside of this, this framework. So no one can come along later and add some more. You can't you know, put Ninja in one in a new release without releasing everything else and things like this. So it's, um, 
It's really quite useful. So just, um, just a little bit of an aside is that the, the case class we started with, I had an invoice with a, a Boolean and an integer. Um, there might even be an argument there that using Booleans and ints is probably not the most appropriate. You know, it's kind of using Booleans as, as parameters to methods and, and constructors is often seen as an anti-pattern. So perhaps something like this could have been more appropriate. You know, just some kind of marker trait maybe, just say, you know, what the, what the true and false actually mean. And then, you know, when you come back to this code in six months' time or you, your colleague looks at it or you have some debugging, um, you know, this, this will be quite, quite helpful. Okay, so again, like, what we can do, and like, this is the real point I've been getting to, is we can now provide a really, really solid way of getting out of our ADT. You know, if we've got some JSON and we want to do something with it that's not JSON, you know, maybe we want to display it on the screen in a nice way or send it in a binary format over the wire, you know, we, we, we can use the, 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 the properties that, that we've got from, from uh, the help with the language to, to, to enable us to um, map this into a different type in a, in a, in a pretty, co pretty coherent way. And so this is called folding, okay? And so the example we, we've been working with, we've got this database response type, and effectively we want to turn this into some other type. And you can probably think of ways we can do this already, right? You know, we can just, we can just pattern match. You know, pattern matching is good, it's really nice, it's fun, it's very clear. You can drill down into nested types and stuff. Um, and that's great. But we, we can be even more confident and solid in our code. And we can build this functionality into our types. Okay, so if we go back to our original trait, we, we can add a, a method on the, on the trait, which I've called fold. And it's a higher order function. And so there, there's two parameters here. The first one is a function that takes a pair of arguments and returns some type A. The second one takes this string and returns an A, and then the whole thing returns an A. And hopefully, hopefully these types you probably recognize from the previous slides. And so these are the values that made up our, our invoice type, and then this string was our error message. And so what we're doing is we're effectively using this function, we're giving it kind of sets of recipes, and we're saying, you know, if we want to fold this and, and we're actually working with a, an invoice, then call this function and you'll get an A out. But alternatively, if you thought you had an invoice but actually you've got uh, an error message, then you're going to end up calling the other method. And, you know, this, is, this would be implemented something like this. So we maybe will expect some, some other function just so that we know which of the two, two values we have, and then we just call the right method. Like, this is, nothing, this is nothing kind of over the top here, okay? So just have a look at how this is done with options. Again, I've lifted this code directly from um, the Scala 2.12 code base, um, and it literally is this. So it's very, very slightly different to the previous slide in that if we're, if we're in the none object, and clearly that there's, you know, there's, no, there's no way to go from air, from emptiness, to another value. So we have to provide a default here. And then otherwise, if we have the sum case. And then a bit of an exercise here is that every other function that appears on object can be written using this. Okay, so if you want to map something, you can do it. For each, exists, get or else, they can all be boiled down to, to this one here, okay? And again, just point out, and this was on the previous slide as well, is that this function here, this is not the sum of A to B, this is the actual constituent underlying value that the sum holds. Okay, so in our imaginary JSON world, um, we might end up writing something like this. So it's, you know, it's, it's a bit more involved, because we've got a bit more you know, a few, more, a few more states to cover, okay? So if we're dealing with a number, when we need our function to go from a number to something else. You know, if we've got, say, the string to go to something else. And of course, this might be, this might be recursive in some way. You know, we've got lists of JSON and JSON and things like that. So we might need to, to work on that. 
And so when we looked at this previous one here, like this, this is a one-liner, which is really quite simple because we only had two states, right? The sum and the none, and the none's a really easy case to look after anyway. Well, this is probably going to be a little bit more involved. And probably under the hood, the best way to, to, to run this function, and when we want to work out whether we've got a number or a null or an object or thing, we're probably going to pattern match. Okay? So like, what's the point? Why are we doing this? Right? I've just said, don't use pattern matching. Use this instead. But then under the hood, we're probably using pattern matching. Okay? But this is okay, right? This is the same way why we all know that mutability is a bad thing. But then when you look at, say, how um, a lot of the, the lists, uh, the list code is in implemented, that uses mutability. Um, so it's really just encapsulating um, that behavior in one place. And so this is the kind of reason why I, I wanna, would, would rather be using something like a fold rather than explicit pattern match, is that what we want to do is say, for instance, in six months' time, you know, we've been working on other things, we come back to this or whatever, and um, we want to add a new class into, a, into our database response type. And say, we, I don't know, say we've got something like this, so some kind of purchase request. It takes an item and a cost. And so now our database response can either give us some invoices, give us purchase requests, or it can, can give us an error. Okay, so we're the diligent programmers and we update our fold, so now we've got this extra line in here, is that hopefully you'll see that straight away that anything that was using fold before is just going to break. It's literally not going to compile, okay? So you've got to go and fix all those, and you have to fix them by making sure you've covered the case where you need to, you need to deal with th this extra type here. So, my top tip for this would be to use folding where possible, but I think probably another tip that's probably slightly outside the scope of this talk would just be, you know, turn on all compiler warnings to be errors. That will find, you know, so if, if we'd made this change and um, we were using pattern matching, then our compiler would start giving us warnings, saying we've got non-exhaustive pattern matching, um, which is fine. It will still compile. Um, it will then blow up in production when we have a match error. Um, but then you might not see the warning when you're writing your code because you know dealing with several several hundred classes and you know large CI builds and things and um, you know an, an, an extra warning line might just go amiss. If you turn on the compiler warnings as errors, you, you'll probably find your code will end up being a lot cleaner anyway. And then this is going to help when you start to do non-exhaustive pattern matching, yeah, amongst other things. Okay, so that, that was that's basically what, what folding is, really. So I thought we'd have a bit of fun and, and maybe create our own algebraic data type. And I thought one thing we could look at doing would be implementing red-black trees. People familiar with red-black trees? Yeah, I kind of skipped around it at university because it just sounded really complicated. But um, for those who don't know, so a red-black tree is a self-balancing binary search tree each node on the tree has this extra bit, and that usually represents red or black. And then these colors are used to make sure that the, the tree remains balanced at all times. Okay, so there's, a couple, there's another thing we could say as well. So I don't know if people are aware of this book, uh, Purely Functional Data Structures. It's kind of the, the holy bible of, of writing data structures in functional programming. You know, this is where a lot of the concepts to do with immutability um, and sharing code in a, in a safe and concurrent way come from. And so Chris says this. He says, there's two invariants. Number one is that no red node has a red child. And number two, every path from the root to an empty node contains the same number of black nodes. Okay? So let's, um, let's start to implement this. Okay, so I think the first thing we have to do is have some kind of ADT for, for dealing with red and black. Um, I have spelt color correctly, by the way. Um, and so this is really just going to mark, you know, whether we've got a, re a red. You know, it's so much, this is so hard. Like, I mean, I'm British, right? But I always spell color the other way because that's just what you do. And just so many typos writing this. But um, so things can either be red or blue. And you know, we we don't really care about what we hold. 
Um, so we're, we're going to parameterize this to be some kind of type. Okay, and then we need a tree, and a tree can be one of two things: it can either be empty, so there's no there's no children, there's no there's no value, there's nothing like that. Or we have a tree where we have some kind of element which has a particular color, and then we have some left children and we have some right children, right trees. Okay, and generally the ones on the left are the 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 elements in the child tree on the left will be less than this element, and the ones on the right will be greater than. And whatever less than means, or greater than means, is, is, you know, is up to you. OK. So the first thing we're going to have to do is that, you know, we want to look at you know, getting out of the, the, this color type. Because as interesting as it is, it it's kind of doesn't really matter outside of this, this domain. Like, we don't want to be exposing red and black things to, to other, other environments. So we want to fold over this. And, and this would be something what we'd do. So we have a couple of functions. And they, the, both of these functions have the same type, because the red and the black types um, held values of the same type. So we have a function for when it's red and a function for when it's black. And then the fold is simply, if we're dealing with a red one, call the red function, otherwise call the black function. Okay, so this, is, this is simple stuff. And then we, we're going to have a helper as well which calls this. And all this does is th this will then extract the element in a nice way for us. And so the identity function is a function that simply returns the value it was passed. And so this will become you know, a function from A to A. This will return that A. And, and there we, that, that, that's how we would get the element out without caring whether we've got a red or a black um, holder for this, for this value. OK, so a useful operation that, that exists on, on red black trees. Well, one thing is we want to make sure, you know, is, is a given element in the tree? And then we might, we might write this kind of something like this. So we have a function called member. We want to see if this element appears in this tree. And also, we're, we're going to, you know, pass a, we're going to have a, a type class for deciding on, on the ordering. So therefore, we, we don't need to care about that at all. And so we're going to pattern match on this tree. If it's empty, it's clearly not in the tree. And then otherwise, we can pattern match here. And then all we want to do is pull the element out using this nice little fold we wrote a minute ago. If, it's, if the element we're looking for is less than this, then we're in the left tree. If it's greater than, we're in the right tree. Otherwise, we must have found the element. OK? So that's not the, uh, not the most interesting. OK, so another thing we can do is insert elements into trees. And this is a, this is a little bit more involved. OK? So the insertion looks, well, the signature would look like this. So we have an element of type A. See, we don't care about the color here. This is purely a kind of an internal thing. And then we have a tree. And then we're, we're going to have a, an inner function to really work with this. And then if we're inserting an element into an empty tree, then well, we've got a new tree. And then looking at the invariants we saw a minute ago, then that generally has to be red. And then the, the subchildren will be empty as well. OK. Um, if we don't, if we have something else, then the code looks something like this. And it is quite similar to the slide before, in that simply, if the element is less than, we want to insert this recursively into the left tree, otherwise into the right tree. But then as well, we need to make sure that this invariant hold that we talk, help. We need to make sure that this invariant still holds that we talked about a minute ago. So we, we have this kind of balance function. OK? And then this is all inside an uh, inner function. So then we just kick this off with the, with the given tree. OK? So have a look at balancing the tree. And this. Um, you, know, you might have to pay attention for this, because this, this is quite involved. Okay, But basically, we need to turn trees that look like this into this. Okay, So this, this is allowed. This is a, 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 a tree that is relevant in, in the world of red-black trees, and this one isn't. So the invariant here, no red node has a red child. You can see this does. So this code on the previous slide, if we weren't balancing it, would create trees like this. 
and therefore it's not balanced, and so searching the tree later on will not give as good performance as, say, one that was balanced. Okay? Okay, so let's have a look at the code for this. So we're going to balance, given the element, and a couple of trees. Okay? And what I'm going to show you is going to use these variable names throughout the whole thing. Okay? And we're going to make extensive use of pattern matching. So this might look a bit funky. Okay. So it looks something like this. Okay, so what we've got here is a tree where the left hand is a tree and the right hand is a tree and then our element is a red value and that's on the left tree. The top level is a black one and then the, the right hand tree we don't care about and that corresponds to this. Okay, and if we get the... If, if we're, if we're balancing and we end up in a state, if we find that the, the given tree looks like this, then we can just use these values to create a tree that looks like that. And we're just using pure pattern matching to do this. And this really, this underlines the, um, the value of pattern matching and immutability, is that these subtrees, A, B, C, D, we've not even touched them. So if they're balanced and they're all nice, they don't get changed. You know, other other threads or other processes using those same trees, you know, they're never going to get touched anyway, but they, they can use the, shame, the shared value in memory and things like that. So we, we get this nice, the nice use with pattern matching in order to kind of shuffle things around in, in the way they should be. And so for this unbalanced tree here, there are actually four, four different states, if you can work them out. So for, the ch for Y, the children could be the other way around. So X could be where C is and vice versa, and then Y could be where D is, and then if that's the case, then you've got X and C where they are and X and C the other way around. But all the time with those, they end up making a tree that looks something like this. And this is, this is what Chris talks about in his book, is that you get this really nice use with pattern matching, and, and in other languages, you, you're able to kind of do this effectively in one line, but you have to do it in five in, in Scala. Okay, so then we can just drill through the other cases I just talked about that look something like this. And you can see these right-hand sides are all the same. And then we've got a nice balanced tree. We've not changed any data we don't need to. And then we can just move on, and we, we've got a balanced tree for whatever operations we needed. And then, of course, if we tried to balance with something that was none of those states, then it's going to be balanced anyway. And so we move on. Okay, and so that's um, that's kind of it. That's kind of the, the what I really wanted to show and, and kind of spend time discussing. And so, kind of a look at what we talked about. So, we spent a little bit of time kind of discussing why they're algebraic and what that means. Okay, we looked we looked at fold, we looked at um, options, we looked at lists, we looked at our own JSON type as well, and hopefully, hopefully that all made sense. You know, it's pretty. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, we investigated folding and, and how that works. And then we've created this brand new collection type. And you know, we've made full use of, of, the, of the language here. We're not just using algebraic data types. You know, we've extensive use of pattern matching, extensive use of immutability. Um, you know, really everything that should be in a kind of everyday scholar programmer's toolbox. Um, and you know, algebraic data types are one of those things. So, yeah, that's all I had to talk about. So, you know, thanks for coming along. It's quite a, quite a busy room. Thanks for coming. And um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, I'd love to have a go at answering them. While the microphone's going, you should go and see my colleagues talk tomorrow. He's the, he's the good-looking fellow with the crutches. Um, so Andy's speaking tomorrow morning. Or class up your config. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the formal properties of an ADT? Um, I've, I've tried not to do that. I, I've tended to step away from the formal stuff when I've given talks. Um, I tend to try and kind of be practical and say, you know, why, why it's good to use them. Uh, 
I'm going to hold my hands up and say off the top of my head, I'm not going to, I'm not going to know, so I wouldn't want to get, get those wrong for the video. But it's basically that, right? <laughs> Got, a, got one, there's one there and one there. Uh, so regarding folds, um, you mentioned that uh, we should probably use them instead of uh, pattern matching, but yeah. if uh, you use them, you will not get a match error or this compiler warning. Uh, is it really adventures? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a huge fan of of leaning on the compiler. So if I you know if I'm using folds and I'm going to be changing or you know expanding my types, you know if I write a new type, you know one of the things I'd do would then be update my fold method, which causes everything to break, and then nothing's going to run until I fix that. Which I in my I mean things like match errors, you know they you know wake me up in a cold sweat because those are things that you know, could easily be fixed at, at compile time rather than you know leaking all the way to production. Um, but you can forget to add uh, a case or the new parameter to the fault method. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is no this is no magic. You know, it's like you've you've got to do some stuff, right? You know, pattern matching will help you to avoid that. Uh, I don't say advantage over. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, the thing is, if you don't do it, then you. Know, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of it's kind of one or the other, right? Um, but I, I think the thing with me is that, like, you know, if you've got a large code base and you're pattern matching all over the place, then you've got to update all of those places. Where if you've in all of those places used a fold, then as soon as you update the root method, it, the compiler is going to tell you everywhere you need to fix it instantly. So that's kind of my rationale behind that. I, I prefer that to. You know, hunt, hunting the warnings, and you know, absolutely. You know, you know, if we've got, if we've got, you know, if we're diligent with our code, and, and we've got the warnings turned to errors and things like that, then yeah, there, there's very little difference. And you're absolutely right. You know, it's one place or the other. But I, I, I prefer this because it, it really makes things much more explicit in my mind. Um, and yeah, that's kind of why why I do that anyway. So, <clears throat> uh, is there is there any kind of uh, impact? Uh, negative impact or disadvantage <laughs> using the absurd data types? So I think the question there is like, is there, an, is there a negative side to using ADTs? Yes, um, yes. I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the discussion we've just had here. You know, pattern matching is nice. Like I've used pattern matching all through the talk. You know, the, the red black trees at the end, you know, they use pattern matching. Pattern matching is great. You get this really nice um, setup with being able to extract values, you know, for, you know, using, um, um, the unapplied style. Um, so yeah, you know, but I'm, uh, it's tough because I, I'd rather I'd rather you know have the compiler be telling me everywhere things are broken. And uh, the thing is as well is that if I'm using a fold, is that straight away, you know, the the method signature tells me everything I need to do. It says you've got to write a function for this. You've got to write a function for that. You've got to write a function for this. Rather than you know, you've got your two windows open and you've got to drill through all the types um, of your ADT to make sure that you've got them all covered and things like that. You know, this is very, you know, I'm, I'm kind of grasping at straws a little bit here. But, um, yeah, you know, I like, I like pattern matching. It's kind of one of the things that definitely drew me to the language. Um, there's, there's, this is not a pattern matching, bashing talk, without a doubt. Um, I'm just trying to show that, you know, there's this really nice property of, you know, groups of classes that are marked with a sealed trait, and the, the value that gives at both a kind of understanding of your own domain and also um, how, how the, the compiler can help you and, and what that kind of says about your code. So I hope, hope that answers you. it. Yeah. Any more? No? Yes? Oh, yeah. You use the fold in uh, the color, and you said you don't want to, show, to put color out because it's internal. But after all, your fold, you put the identity. Identity is a more simple way to do it. But mm -hmm. if you want something a bit more complicated, you need to put your internals out. Like 
Yeah, 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 so. yeah. But yeah, purely, purely just for this, that was you know, just a, a, sim a simple example. But yeah. Okay, all right, well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>